From the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what we're working on for you this October weekend. A big corn crop is just getting bigger, yet corn prices managing to recover right after the report. So what pulled corn into the green? Plus, cool and wet weather across the southern plains means trouble is brewing for cotton yields. Well, dairy farmers doing what they do best. Fewer cows are making more milk. And now a few states are trying to find a home for all that milk. And in John's world, farmers and the boiling frog. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Now for the news that moved the markets this week. The saying is big crops only get bigger and that's exactly the case for this year's corn crop. U.S. Department of Agriculture's October crop production report out Thursday pointing to a bump in corn production and yield. USDA pegs this year's national corn yield at 171.8 bushels per acre. That's a 1.9 bushel hike from last month. Now the increased yield puts total production at 14.3 billion bushels nationwide. But USDA not so optimistic about soybeans, pegging yield at 49.5 bushels per acre. That's a decrease from the 49.9 yield USDA posted in the September report. It's also a half bushel less than the average trade guess. But with a record number of soybean acres comes a record production, with that number forecast to hit 4.43 billion bushels nationwide this year. Rains halting harvest in many areas this week, and those rains are not what some farmers needed as harvest is falling behind. Here's a map of all the states where corn harvest lags the five-year average. Now, most of those states trailing in double digits, with Iowa falling 20 points behind, Minnesota down 22, South Dakota 23 points behind in corn harvest. Now, it's a different story in soybeans with more mixed progress, but where harvest is lagging, it's way behind. Iowa down 19 points from average, Minnesota falling 41 points behind, Nebraska down 23, and North Dakota 20 points behind normal. But check out the states where soybean harvest is moving right along, including Illinois, Indiana, and most of the South. But it's more than just a slow harvest. It's turning into a tough one. Look at these pictures Wayne Martin sent us. He farms in western Iowa. He says they've had 5.6 inches of rain since the first of the month, and that means pods are getting weak, even the soybeans falling out of the pods. Well, USDA also shaving off cotton production this week, projecting it to fall 3% from last month. But with more acres, that's still 23% higher than last year. The hurricanes and other weather taking a bite out of yield. USDA thinks cotton yield will fall 19 pounds from last month. Beef buys continue on its impressive pace this year. U.S. Meat Export Federation says August beef exports were 5% higher than a year ago and the largest export number so far this year. Export value reaching the second highest on record at $679.1 million. That's a 20% jump from last year. Now the sharp jump can be attributed to Japan where exports shot up 22% from year ago levels, hitting the largest since what the Federation calls the post BSE era. Export value to Japan jumped up 35 and broke the $200 million mark for the first time in 21 years. And moving to pork, USMEF says while pork exports came in 9% below last year's record pace, the value of those exports is still on the rise, up 11% from last year. Agriculture's national forecast is brought to you by Elevo Seed Treatment from Bayer. All right, those are the headlines. Meteorologist Cindy Claussen is filling in for Mike Hoffman this week, who is on a mission trip. So keep Mike in your thoughts and prayers. Well, Cindy, harvest is really starting to run behind in many states, and rain this week did not help that situation any. No, it certainly didn't, but it did help with some of the drought situation, especially as you get to further to the northwest. But this is the latest U.S. drought monitor, and what we really do notice over the past week, in fact, a couple of weeks, is that the dryness is spreading to the east. Let's take a look at that change over the last month, and you can see as we put this into motion, you're going to see that uh, drought really starting to chip away, especially in the Dakotas and into Montana, but you see that eastward progression into the central and eastern Corn Belt 
south and into parts of the eastern United States. Not as bad as what we're seeing in uh, the Dakotas and Montana, but certainly something that we're going to be keeping an eye on as we get through the next few months. Now, what can we expect for the week ahead? We are expecting for a lot of drier weather, at least for the first part of the week. So we might actually get some of that harvest done after a wet weekend in many spots of the nation's midsection. As we head through Monday, we're going to be looking at the wet weather in the southeast and the far northwest, but most of the rest of the country is expecting to be dry on Monday. As we head towards Wednesday, kind of a similar situation. Most of the moisture staying to the north of us, the southeast, especially around Florida. We're looking at scattered showers and thunderstorms and some rain and upper elevation snow in the Pacific Northwest. Now, as we head to Friday, what we are expecting is another system to move through the country and we're going to be seeing some more showers and maybe some rumbles of thunder into the Great Lakes and into the Corn Belt as well. So that might bring some rain, uh, but hopefully we'll get some more of that uh, harvest work done as we head into the week. Tyne. Thanks, Cindy. Well, despite USDA raising the corn yield, corn prices seen green immediately after the report. So what did the trade view as bullish? Naomi Bloom and Brian Fasting join me next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, right off the top of the show, we talked about this latest USDA report, you know, and, and we finally got, I guess, some, some decent news from USDA to have corn and beans both in the day higher. But what was your biggest takeaway from the report this week, Naomi? Um, the biggest thing for me was more in regards to soybeans. And it was nice that the USDA lowered the yields. Um, instead of 49.9, now yield is 49.5, which really helped with the market to find support. But I think the rally came from the fact that ending stocks for old crop were reduced, which then made ending stocks for new crop reduced by um, nearly 35 million bushels. And that was a big deal. It was enough for people in the market to say, okay, we don't need to pressure prices lower. Mm -hmm. And so you saw some, some technical buying and some fundamental buying as well. Do you think those ending stocks really were what helped push prices higher this week, Brian? There's only some weather premium this time of year tying with South America too. I think we're just getting started in South America. We don't want to read too much into this, but with world demand exceptionally strong, historically strong, we need another big crop in South America on top of the big crop we have here in the U.S. So a combination of factors is surprisingly uh, dip in the U.S. yields and probably some weather premium in South America now. But shaving just, I mean, you know, shaving a little bit off that USDA yield, is that, I mean, does that make that big of a difference uh, to the balance sheets? Um, it, it makes enough of a difference from the standpoint of prices shouldn't fundamentally go lower. So that's the difference. It's given us a harvest low. Um, as Brian was saying, now with the harvest low in place, we don't have a big reason to fundamentally rally in and of U.S. soybean numbers mm. themselves. However, now we're going to be watching constantly South American weather, South American planting progress. South America grows half of the world's soybeans, yeah. so it matters what they do over the next few weeks. Yeah, one of my questions to, ask, to talk about this week was when does South America come into play? So let's go into that a little bit more because it sounds like that's sooner rather than later. Um, you mentioned harvest low, so Brian, do you agree? Do you think, at least in the soybean complex, we've hit a harvest low here? I mean, every year is different time. It certainly feels like that the market got enough news with this report that it's probably not gonna be sharply lower. Uh, for the immediate future. I guess you could say today, again, we don't, we don't price predict, but I would say today that the odds are that's behind us. Having said that, that doesn't mean that later on here in calendar 18, for example, that we couldn't make new lows. That's what we saw here in the 2016-17 crop here. Well, you know, with this yield, early on I heard some really impressive yields in soybeans. And, and I mean, you know, some areas that normally they would get 40, 50 bushels, some areas seeing 80 bushel beans. It seems like that's, that news has kind of trailed off a little bit. So do you feel like there is more room for this soybean yield to come down since the early yields appear to be better than what we're seeing later in the season? I, I think that they potentially could, but not by too much. Because what we're hearing from producers across the Midwest is that, you know, it's not as good as last year. Last year was the crop on steroids. Everything was <laughs> 70 or 80, you know, bushels to the acre. Um, this year, it's such a variety that you're hearing, but it's not that crazy number like last year. But corn, USDA raising the corn yield, um, and not just by a half a bushel. I mean, we're talking 1.9 bushels per acre. It is a really good corn crop out there. Um, could we see that yield continue to go higher? Um, and if so, what potentially could that do to prices down the road? There's mixed news on that historically, tying in years since 2000 when we've seen 
the October yield surpassed the, the September yield. There's been eight times that's happened. Five times subsequently in November, the yield's gotten higher. Hmm. So. But that's just, where that saying big crops big only crops get, bigger. get bigger however okay. just recently in 2014 we did see a reduction when we saw that that pattern so what would it do to prices with a bigger yield the thing about corn that's different from beans is we got such strong export demand for beans we have such weak export demand for corn because of that competition from brazil so i think the corn is kind of a tag along at this point uh, i think a bigger yield would probably weigh on the corn market so is it soybeans that then brought corn prices higher on, on Thursday. I mean, when I saw that yield initially, I thought there's no way corn prices are going to end in the green today. But, you know, December contract reached a contract life low earlier in the day and then managed to, to finish green. I mean, that was pretty positive. That was a huge deal. So, um, yeah, technically speaking, uh, corn was able to put in a bullish outside reversal, which is a nice technical sign of a bottom. And, and that corn market is definitely the follower in this. Soybeans are the leader and thank goodness so soybeans had such a friendly report because otherwise that report for corn was totally bearish, absolutely bearish. So corn in and of itself fundamentally right now does not have a reason to rally. It, it just doesn't. It'll probably trade sideways, slowly work higher from for short covering on funds, but in order for that corn market to move higher we need that export pace to pick up. We also need to have um, Bad things happen in South America as far as their growing goes. But um, yeah, we got to keep an eye on exports, the value of the dollar, and we'll probably continue to see yields stay larger. All right. So with this corn crop, have we put in a harvest low? We talked about soybeans, but have we put in a harvest low for corn? We'll get their thoughts when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by the Liberty Link System, the simply better solution for a stronger yield and superior weed control from Bayer. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, a big week with this USDA report. Um, hitting on corn before we kind of switch topics here, do you think that we've put this, this harvest low possibly in on the corn market as well? I think anytime you talk about a market that's as fragile like corn is, you got to watch now South America because domestically in corn, we have ample supplies. Worldwide for corn, we have ample supplies and we have competition from South America in terms of exports. So. I mean, short term here, the market's found at least a base at 340, 345. But longer term, I think we've got to keep in mind if South America has another big crop, the market could be vulnerable to a pullback in early 18. So that's why you're calling it a fragile crop, just because we do have so much of it on our hands still? I think a producer has got to defend their balance sheet because the, the corn yields have been surprisingly high. Yeah. And right now, the only thing that's supporting corn, in our opinion, at least at this point, is probably the strength in the bean market. Anything that changed on the export side, when you look at the stocks and, you know, making the USDA making some adjustments, anything that you saw positive there with exports that have, that have changed? No, no. The only thing positive export-wise actually happened uh, this morning when we had some, the late announced export sales because of the holiday Monday with Columbus Day. We had great export sales for corn and beans, both. But as far as the report goes, there was nothing there to give us any extra love just because South America, Brazil has been stealing a lot of our um, export business. But also, if you're an end user from another country, why would you, you know, just suddenly import more and more corn when the U.S. producer can store it here and then they can just buy it as they need it? So it might take a while for that uh, market to start working higher. It's going to take uh, some weather scare from South America. But overall, when you look at this USDA report, did you even though we finished in the green, did you view this as a bullish report? Maybe a, a good way to look at it time would be to say it didn't get any worse news in terms of negative news. Uh, the market was able to absorb the higher corn yield with the stronger demand for or the stronger uh, feel to the soybean yeah. market, pulling the corn along. But by itself, as a standalone, uh, we're not running out of corn stocks or bean stocks here at all. Yeah, but one little friendly thing on there was that mm -hmm. actually for world carryout for soybeans and world carryout for corn, those numbers did get smaller. So that was really a good thing from the standpoint of just that perception of ending stocks getting smaller around the world puts more pressure, as he had said earlier, for South America needing to have a great crop. And if that crop isn't there, you'll see the marketplace react and you could see the market work mm -hmm. higher for futures anyway. The cash market's going to be a little bit burdensome for a while. Yeah, but overall, you can't call this a bullish report. In your Not minds. for corn, no. So then when you talk about South America, you keep talking about South America. When does that really come into play? When does the trade, you know, um, switch their focus from the U.S. crop then to the South American crop? I mean, if I were to give you a, a rough date, I would say Thanksgiving because we're going to be rapidly finishing up harvest here, hopefully harvest here in the U.S. 
but we rapidly full into scale planting down there in Argentina and Brazil. So, I mean, another month, I think, but, but even maybe a bit earlier than that, but I think we really got our arms around these U.S. yields here probably for the next 30 days. If that's the case, are you suggesting that these producers do anything between now and Thanksgiving? Um, from the standpoint of people probably needing to sell things for har harvest and making space and things like that, um, my mindset is more be considering to reown it, but go out to the further months, July of 2018, with an option strategy. Um, but again, it's going to take something dramatic in South America to make this corn market work higher, or potentially crude oil prices to work higher, and other outside markets to get the corn futures to move up because there's just such a decent supply out there. What's Let the market saying? dictate your strategy. For example, we got a large carry in the corn market. From December to July, mm -hmm. there's 30 cents carry on the board. If you have on-farm storage, one strategy to consider would be to sell that carry, but give yourself flexibility to participate in a rally. One way a producer could do that would be to buy a put option, put a floor in the market, and leave the upside open. But regardless, we strongly encourage folks, get control of your inventory, put a floor into the market, give yourself an opportunity for the market to rally if something happens in South America. And our put's pretty affordable right now? Yeah, the volatility yeah. is historically low, historically cheap on right. put options right now. As a buyer, it is an attractive time to buy options. Okay, all right, we need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we want to get their closing thoughts on U.S. Farm Report, so don't go anywhere. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. Okay, we talked about a lot, so what do you want to leave our viewers with, Naomi? Um, it's pretty tempting right now to just only be focusing on yield and what the yield is doing out there, obviously because it's harvest time. But as a producer, don't forget to keep an eye on the outside markets, especially as we start to finish out 2017. I want to keep an eye on the stock market. If it's going to finally look like it's sending some topping signals anytime soon, that's money that could come in for funds. Keep an eye on crude oil prices. Keep an eye on the dollar because those outside market influence, in addition to South America, will direct prices. Okay, Brian? Defend your balance sheet as a producer. By that I mean get control of your inventory. These yields are better than expected in many cases, not universally so, but defend your balance sheet by getting control, putting a floor in the market for your 2017 crop, leave the upside open, but always maintain flexibility because something can happen in South America that would give these markets some strength. All right, thank you both for being here during this harvest. We appreciate it. Stay with us, we'll check in with John Phipps next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Well, one of my favorite quotes is, we don't grow when things are easy. We grow when we face challenges. And agriculture is full of challenges and changes. Here's John Phipps. There's an old folk fable about how frogs will jump out of boiling water, but if you put them in tepid water and heat it very slowly, they will wait too long to leave and end up boiling. Now, a few years ago, this became a topic for 15 minutes of internet fame and some pretty grisly YouTube videos, but several real experiments suggest this is, unsurprisingly, false. At some point, the frog just hops out. But true or not, it is a durable metaphor for our inability to cope with slow but eventually devastating changes. Partly because we focus on the hassles we need to deal with today, and partly because we think we can outlast some problems, we'll let others in the future figure out what to do. After all, it will be their big and urgent problem, mostly because we didn't trouble ourselves to do anything about it now. We are facing in ag several issues like that climate change, weed resistant, nutrient runoff, and rural population loss come to mind, but I'm sure there are others. Among farmers, I've noted those with generations following them are a little more likely to at least consider actions to manage these growing threats. Moreover, the feeling that we have any obligation to future farmers is not as strong as it once was. Maybe this is something that happens during times of economic stress. Devoting resources to cope with a hazard that will never really change our lives that much is at the bottom of our list of things to spend money and time on. I'm sure other sectors have their own looming challenges. But for agriculture, it seems our list is longer than I can remember. Our ability to forecast the effects of our action into the future has improved. 
So we're getting more and better warnings. And for many of the problems, the actions of one farmer isn't going to make a huge difference. So if everybody else does the right thing, I'm kind of off the hook. Only that's what we all think. The boiling frog myth centered on the frog being too lazy to respond to creeping danger. That could be our problem too, but it could be we're just waiting for all the other frogs to jump out first. Thanks, John. Still to come, more threats to Nick's NAFTA as leaders made their way back to Washington in hopes of hashing out a new deal. But what happens if it's a no deal? That's next on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. From the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. It's the second weekend of October and things are heating up in Washington. Just ahead, what threats of nixing NAFTA could mean to agriculture. It's a big buy in the world of ag as BASF steps up to the plate to buy a major chunk of Bayer's business. It's 100 years of green. Machinery Pete has the story behind this kerosene fueled tractor known as the Waterloo Boy. And from the benefits of no-till to the drawback behind it, that's this week's customer support. Now for the headlines, round four of NAFTA negotiations kicking off this week. And as ag leaders push the administration to turn the slow progress into major headway, the president making more threats to just nix NAFTA. Trade leaders from Canada, Mexico and the U.S. making their way back to Washington, D.C. this week after wrapping up the previous round of trade talks in Canada earlier this month. Now most reports showing little progress made with Farm Journal Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer pointing out the slow progress is typical of trade negotiations negotiations such as this. The U.S. expected to prod at Canada's current dairy management supply during this round of trade talks. That's after U.S. brought up Mexico's increased berry exports unfairly coming into the U.S. under the cost of production in the last round. But the president making stern statements this week, even threatening to nix NAFTA, saying he thinks the only way to get a d good deal is to have no deal. So what if the U.S. doesn't strike a NAFTA 2.0 deal? Jim Wiesmeyer says that's something no one really wants to answer. Well, every time I ask an, a White House official or a trade official that from the U.S., they go, that's conjecture. Let, let's handle that when it happens. But I, you, you should always have a fallback plan. The market needs to know that, but they will not answer that. Is it to just continue the current the NAFTA, by the way, the one that Trump says is the worst trade agreement ever. Uh, but if you don't have any NAFTA, you're going to see a ugly day for the uh, ag markets in the U.S. because that obliterates the integrated North American market. Wiesmeyer says one thing to watch in the NAFTA talks is issues within the auto sector. If leaders find a way to strike a deal there, he thinks the other deals could fall into place. Meanwhile, the Trump administration submitting a 70 point immigration enforcement plan to Congress Sunday. It includes a massive overhaul in order to eliminate any loopholes within the current law. The president's plan calls for a border wall, more deportation agents, a crackdown on sanctuary cities and structure limits to what they call chain immigration. It also gives federal agents more leeway to deny illegal immigrants at the border and arrest illegal immigrants already in the U.S. Well, chips are starting to fall into place for Bayer buying out Monsanto. That's after another major acquisition was made this week. Bayer announcing it's selling its row crop seeds and traits business to BASF. The buy includes the Liberty Link brand and technology and the research and development behind it all. The price tag, $7 billion. Bloomberg reporting that's 15 times BAF's earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation. The company say the transaction not only includes the intellectual property and facilities, but also the more than 1,800 employees around the world tied to the business. Well, the cuts from Hurricane Irma still being counted as state officials now expect Florida's orange crop to drop to levels not seen since 1942. State estimates point to production hitting 54 million boxes, down 21% from last year. But USDA's latest crop production report pointing to a number higher than that. Florida's Ag Commissioner Adam Putnam saying USDA's latest forecast does not accurately estimate the damage while giving another plea for federal aid. Both Florida's governor and Ag Commissioner in Washington 
Washington this week, making the case for more disaster aid to help cover the extensive losses. Well, the hurricanes also taking a big bite out of U.S. pecan production. USDA says as much as 35% of Georgia's pecan crop was lost to Hurricane Irma and Hurricane R. Harvey wiped out about 3 million pounds of Texas's production. The administration declaring emergency in California this week. That's after deadly wildfires are suffocating California's wine country, with a California fire chief calling it pure devastation. Now, more than a dozen wildfires ignited this week, forcing mass evacuations. Officials say effects on the local ag industry will be catastrophic as ashes are all that remain in some places. At least five wineries in Napa Valley have been destroyed or significantly damaged. Meanwhile, from wildfires to hurricanes, the price tag from natural disasters are adding up this year, and that forced the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, to deny North Dakota's request for a disaster declaration for the state's devastating drought. Nearly 94% of the state cut was covered by drought when the governor made the declaration request in early August. The governor says he understands the increased disaster demands and remains grateful to USDA for its quick response and emergency assistance. Agriculture's national forecast is brought to you by Kawasaki and the new Mule Pro FXR side-by-side. -side. Ride like a boss with high-end styling and rugged capability. All right, that's it for the news. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen joins us for a longer range look at weather. You know, Cindy, states like Montana, Kansas, and Iowa see more drought relief this week, but that's not the case for areas of California that really needed it. No, Tyne, you're right, but also the ridge and the jet stream warmer temperatures, those aren't helping either. Here's a look at what we can expect in the jet stream over the next week. Trough moving across the sort of northeastern part of the United States, still remaining warm in much of the west. We'll have another trough digging in as we get into the middle part of the week. That's going to bring some stormy weather, but especially in the northern part. Some of those uh, California areas may not really see some good relief, but it's going to be a pretty decent trough as we, as we get into the latter part of next week, bringing some chilly air to the northwest while we see a warm up in the east. Now, as far as as we look over the next 30 days or so, we are looking at temperatures on the warm side in the eastern half of the country. The cooler signal is right over here in parts of the northern Rockies. Heading into your precipitation, the all important one this time of the year looks like some wetter weather in the upper Midwest and into the northern plains, but it looks like that dry weather continuing as you get into from the northeast, mid Atlantic all the way down toward Arkansas and northeastern Texas. Tyne? Thanks, Cindy. Well, whether it's lack of labor or the cost of doing business, some dairies are searching for a new home. States like South Dakota not only welcoming those dairies with open arms, but working diligently the past two years on recruiting those dairies to their home turf. The relocation efforts are so successful that it spurred a new problem a milk surplus. And as Michelle Rook tells us, U.S. dairy leaders now working during World Dairy Expo to find that milk a new home. Midwest dairy states are facing a processing deficit and are here at the World Dairy Expo trying to recruit new dairy processing plants. After years of having a milk deficit in South Dakota, the state is facing a surplus. Fewer cows are making more milk and we've added enough cows in the state of South Dakota. We filled our dairy processing plants today. So World Dairy Expo was another recruitment trip for the state. What we're trying to do now is find alternative methods of processors coming into the state of South Dakota. Meanwhile, neighboring Nebraska is facing an even bigger milk surplus. Uh, we're in a situation where right now we have uh, about two thirds of the milk that is produced in Nebraska actually leaves the state for processing in other places. So the newly formed Grow Nebraska Coalition was also at Expo promoting economic incentive packages and willing sites in the I-80 corridor. We have a lot of good production, productive land along Interstate 80 and a lot of good areas for dairies to grow and to develop. So uh, that's primarily where the uh, communities that got involved with us are located. Beyond finding the right site, the biggest challenge is the high cost to build. It is very expensive. I mean, when you're talking $200 million for a plant or higher, it, it's, it, it takes time. In the meantime, there are existing processors expanding within the region. We we're finally in the process of growing our plant in Sanborn, Iowa, uh, more than doubling the capacity there to make room for more milk. And he says that's far less costly than building new. We can maybe expand uh, Sanborn for $20 million or maybe less. Producers admit processing expansion can be a bit of a chicken and egg proposition. 
They need the milk and they need to be able to market the finished product. So there's a lot of moving pieces. However, he says it's necessary for the future of the entire dairy industry. In Madison, Wisconsin, I'm Michelle Rook reporting for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. And the issue of too much milk doesn't seem to be easing. The latest USDA milk production report showed August's milk production levels climbed 2.1 percent over 2016. But milk production per cow hit the highest level ever recorded. Now the milk industry will get a fresh look at production when USDA releases its next report on October 20th. Up next, John Phipps. No-till minuses. Your call is very important to us. Please hold. Well, John dug into no-till last week looking at the benefits, but with any good, also comes some bad. Here's John Phipps. Last week, we looked at the many real advantages and benefits of no-till farming. This week, the other side of the story. Here are the challenges I have observed with the most important listed last. First, as songwriter Roger Miller explained, some can and some can't and some can. Farmers rapidly found out a new set of management skills and operating practices, many of which discarded cherished production traditions, were harder to adopt than we imagined. No-till systems are more problematic on heavy, poorly drained soils. They can be slow to warm up and dry out in the spring, making it planting a uh, timeliness issue. Heavy residue from high-yielding corn, for instance, can be tough to get seed into. More than a few longtime no-tillers were unable to find a solution to corn after corn, for instance. Without tillage, if gullies do develop, there's nothing to stop them from deepening. The machinery for no-till farming has gone from the old planter, sprayer, 100 horsepower tractor and combine dream of the 1980s to more sophisticated and expensive tools. There is still an economic advantage, just smaller than we thought it was going to be. Ongoing challenges to no-till have spawned alternatives, notably strip-till. Now, what are the call this no-till or not is an open question, but similar workarounds bend the tillage rules. Furthermore, no-tilling beans into corn residue and using conventional tillage the following year seems to diminish the advantages of continuous no-till. Many of the benefits of no-till take considerable time to manifest. Proponents say water infiltration, uh, for example, improves after five to eight years of continuous no-till. Such long-term paybacks are hard for producers to embrace, especially if yields and profits suffer during that learning phase. However, this is what I think will prove to be the Achilles heel for no-till. It is 100% chemically dependent. This fact is often overlooked as no-till advocates argue it is more environmentally responsible. It's no coincidence that no-till took off after glyphosate became available. GM crops only added momentum. But as I talked about a few weeks ago, there is a reasonable chance that weed resistance could neutralize the power of herbicides. And if this occurs, no-till is in trouble. I would add this note. It could be that no-till is a superior way of growing crops. However, the fact that it is still practiced by a minority of farmers in the U.S. suggests to me it either is effective on some farms with some farmers or it really is hard to fool most of the people all of the time. Thanks, John. And keep those questions and comments coming in. Just email those to mailbag at usfarmreport.com. Well, when we come back, we head out west and check in with Baxter Black. This is Machine Repeat, inviting you to check out my new website, machinerypeat.com, offering farmers tens of thousands of used equipment listings to search. Let Machine Repeat help you find and value your next piece of used equipment. Well, most of us didn't land our so-called dream job right out of high school or college, and such is the case for Baxter Black. It helps to know a little about a lot of things. It allows you to make a fool of yourself in a lot of different ways. For instance, I worked in a sheep parasitology laboratory while I was in ag school, and I tell people casually that I helped work out the life cycles of Thysanosoma actinoides and Iliophora schneideri. What I really did was hold the sheep and recover their intestinal contents at the slaughterhouse. 
I can actually dazzle people with my savvy of the anatomy of the hippopotamus, the rhinoceros, the blue whale, the giraffe, and the elephant. I spent many weeks preparing my senior veterinary school thesis titled, The Anatomy of Five Non-Domestic Mammals Regardless of the Threats Made by the Faculty Board that if I chose such a frivolous subject, they would give me a D. I started working in the feedlots as a summer vet student. And over a period of three years in three different feedlots, I must have necropsied 300 head of dead beasts in my search for knowledge. My horse training knowledge can be summed up by my method of preventing my healing horse from swinging too far out to the right as I turn to throw my heel loop. You see, my horse is on the right side of the steer's hip because I am left-handed, which according to most team ropers is a sign of the devil. And I thought by covering my horse's right eye, it would prevent him from turning out. And for months, I used this method. However, to some, it appeared foolish. You see, to cover that eye, I used one half of a bikini top. I have had extensive experience with constipated dachshunds, wounded cowboys, bad musical instruments, voracious squeeze shoots, poopy baby calves, Holstein cows that won't breed back, split rims that do bite back, and university faculty boards that try and intimidate me with a D. Yep, it helps to know a little about a lot of things, sometimes. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. You can hear more of Baxter's humor by checking out his website, BaxterBlack.com. When we come back, it's a real tractor treat. When John Deere bought the company, it's the one tractor that was actually in production. We'll go back in history next on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by QLF. For 40 years, QLF has been proud to support American farmers that feed the world. Tractor Tales is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. A little something different for you this week. We're on site at the Farm Progress Show in Decatur, Illinois. And you can see we have something very special behind us here, a Waterloo boy. And we're here with uh, Tiffany Turner from John Deere. And here we sit with a tractor and very significant things happening with Deere and wa Waterloo and the, and the 100 year history. Why don't you tell us about it? 2018 is a huge year of celebration that marks our 100 years of the John Deere tractor. Waterloo Boy actually came out in 1911. Uh, I think an interesting fact that might, many of your viewers might not be aware of is that in 1915, actually our president at that time, who was the son-in-law of Charles Deere, he said that we weren't going to get in that tractor business. And uh, fortunately, with the visionaries and all the board of directors, many closed uh, meetings behind doors, we actually uh, purchased the Waterloo Gasoline Company in uh, 1918. And we want to celebrate that, and we're going to start that celebration now. Every tractor has a story, in my opinion. And I think what's really neat is when you go back to the foundation, it's exciting to see where we started, and then looking around the farm show lot to see where we're going, where we're at today, and where we're headed for tomorrow. Along the lines of a fact people might not remember about deer, but late 50s, early 60s, kind of a transition time. And of course, deer dominant now, but talk about that, how, how things flipped back then. Actually, in the 1960s, we came out with our four-cylinder 10-series tractors, and uh, that's when we overtook the market and became the market leader, and proud to say, very proud to say, that we're still that market leader today. Today's Country Church salute goes to one close to the heartbreaking wildfires in California. The Petaluma Church of Christ had a few members who lost their homes, but the church has opened its doors as an evacuation center. They say the church is far enough from the fires that it's considered a safe place for those forced to leave their homes in Santa Rosa. So unfortunate and heartbreaking. Our thoughts and prayers with all of you. Well, if you have a home church that you would like to send in, you can do that to the address on the screen. All right, stay with us. We have From the Farm Photos next. Welcome back. Well, harvest progress has really slowed down in some areas of the, across the country. Remember at the top of the show when we were talking about harvest and we talked about Minnesota soybean harvest 
falling 40 points behind. Well, recent rains did not help that situation. Tammy Trevish of Minnesota says they received four inches of rain. Look at the water over the road, just adding to the pain this fall. Those farmers were seeing a really good crop this year. Yields look good at Marshall County, Indiana. Our own Ashley Davenport snapped this picture while helping her family harvest this week. Yields, they say, are better than last year. And they were busy trying to harvest before that rain hit last week. Well, our viewers in the panhandle of Nebraska woke up to a different view to kick off the week. A blanket of snow. Yuck. Maryland says they only raise wheat, so it's not halting harvest for them, but they are thankful for the moisture for the new crop. I guess she has a glass half full because if it was October and I was seeing snow, um, I would not be glad. That's for sure. <laughs> well, if you have any pictures or videos that you would like to send in, you can do that to the address on the screen. For all of us at U.S. Farm Report, thank you so much for watching. And be sure to join us again right here next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest lasting heavy duty pickups. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.